In today's video, I thought we could talk a little bit about finding your brand voice. I know that brands or branding can be a bit of an uncomfortable word, especially for creative people, but my personal approach is that if you're trying to sell something, if you're trying to bring awareness to something, if you're trying to build your credibility or teach something in some kind of way, that is what inspires brands in the first place. You're wanting to provide value in a controlled kind of perception so that people eventually are able to associate something, some quality, some attribute with you. There are 10,000 things under the sun that contribute to a brand or a brand image or a branded experience of some kind, right? So the one that I'm wanting to focus on the most is voice versus tone, as the title of this video implies, and how to find your voice, right? A voice is the consistent expression of a brand through words and or writing style. It's about conveying your brand personality, right? Versus tone, which has to do more with the emotional inflection and personality that's infused into a brand's communication. They're very, very similar, but just distinct enough that they both deserve their own definition. So if you're speaking to your ideal audience on a platform like Reddit versus LinkedIn, those are gonna have two completely different tones, even if you're trying to communicate the same thing. You're trying to talk about entrepreneurship, right? Let's just say Reddit is gonna have a very, very casual register versus LinkedIn, which has more of a formal register. People, everyone and their mother is trying to be a thought leader or a leadership guru on LinkedIn. They're gonna have two different types of dialects going on, really. That's, I guess, what I mean by tone. So why is it worth investing in your brand voice or developing your brand voice if you don't have one? Well, it helps people to better like, know, and trust you, especially if you use that voice consistently and if it resonates with people because you've identified your values, you've identified your target audience, you've identified where they hang out, and you've put all the pieces of the puzzle together. So how do we do this? How do we find your voice? Lauren, we get it, we understand it, just get right into it. First thing you wanna do is you wanna reflect on your values. These can be personal or professional values. In the case of authorship, if you're someone who just wants to write, and make a living writing books and be known as an author and that's all you want. I kind of think that that's sort of like a hybrid model where it's like you have a professional image as an author, but you are the face of your authorship brand because you are the author. So there's also a bit of a personable approach to it. Authors kind of land in the middle, but let's say that you are a business owner who's using a nonfiction book that you wrote as a marketing tool. Your business is gonna have its own set of values maybe versus your own personal values. So you're gonna reflect on your values you're gonna consider your target audience, and I'm gonna tell you how to do all this. You're gonna create a mood board, which is really fun, in my opinion, if you're a really visual person. And then finally, we're gonna look at some real life examples to kind of help cement everything. So let's talk a little bit about why identifying your values is so important. It might seem kind of fluffy, but it's gonna be the anchor that sort of roots all of your efforts when it comes to refining or building your brand at all. Values act as the heart of your brand by influencing, by communicating your brand experience and what people can expect from it. It's your North Star, it's your anchor, it's your foundation of, of your house. The values determine a lot. And there's three ways to determine what your values are. The first one is that you can identify a competitor or someone who's really similar to you in content, in structure, in audience, in style, in delivery, in solution, whatever. Type into ChatGPT because I'm a believer that ChatGPT or AI is really good as a supplement for something specific that you're wanting. So in this case, head over to ChatGPT and ask, what is the ideal reader profile for a book like this by this author? Or what is the ideal client profile for a business like this? Once you identify who that target person is, ask ChatGPT, based on this information that you gave me, what qualities, what values, what kind of experience is this brand, is this author, is this book, is this business exuding or implementing or showcasing when it comes to their brand? What values do people associate with their brand? It's just a way to work a little smarter, not harder. It's not rocket science. If you wanna be a little more specific about it, feel free to do your own research. But if you're operating on limited time, like your home girl, this might not be such a bad approach. So that's one, find a competitor, type it into chat GPT, ask what its brand values are. Option number two is you could just research lists of values on the internet and just cherry pick which ones that you like. I would go for anywhere between maybe three to five values or so. I think that's a pretty healthy number. Brene Brown has a pretty good list of values on her website, on her Dare to Lead website, I believe. It's a downloadable PDF, all that stuff. I'll leave a link in the description if you want that. That's where I picked out my values when I was developing my brand. Just for reference, mine is authenticity, balance, connection, dependability, and simplicity. The other option too is just to ask people what you think. Do 
mini five minute interviews with colleagues, with friends, with family, whatever, depending on if you're going with the personal or the professional brand and ask them, hey, what do you think of when you think of me? Or what do you think of when I do X? Or, you know, what have you noticed about the way that I do X, Y, Z, whatever. So those are three pretty simple ways to identify your value to inform the rest of the pieces that go along with creating a cohesive quality brand. Number two, is probably one of the most important steps, which is getting it super clear on your target audience. In fact, I'm doing a webinar series currently at the time of my making this video, and I just did my first of a six part webinar series about defining your target audience. So if you wanna go down that rabbit hole after watching this video, I'll be sure to link that down below put it somewhere at the end of this video, you should definitely check that out if you feel like you need a little bit of help around that. But basically the TLDR version, too long didn't read version of that video is that first you wanna find a competitor. We're all about data over here, baby. We're all about taking notes from what other successful people are doing. So find a competitor. If you're an author, this might look like researching comp titles on Amazon. Comp titles, in case you're not familiar with that, is competitive or comparable titles. This has to do with books that are similar to yours and audience and content and style and delivery. And the reason that I suggest Amazon, I know that people have different feelings about Amazon, but the reason that I suggest it is because they are one of the largest e-retailers, especially for books. They started out selling books. And two, they also have a lot of filters for you to kind of explore and digest. They have really broad categories. They have really niche categories. I would recommend finding anywhere between, I don't know, three, one, one to three to five, I don't know, comp titles, whatever you feel like gives you the best sense of what's out there to see what books are out there that are similar to yours, what they've been successful at, what their author background is, depending on if it's fiction or nonfiction. If you're an author, Amazon's gonna be your best friend in this case. If you're an entrepreneur or a business owner and that's primarily where your focus is, you might wanna identify one to three or so businesses that are similar to yours in size, in niche, in services, in approach, etc. This might be one that you already know about. This might be a colleague of yours. I'm not saying that your colleague is your enemy. That's not at all what I'm saying, but take note of people that you're connected with, events that you've been to, businesses, services that you've heard about. Take one to three of those and think about which ones are similar enough to yours. From there, we're going to use chat GPT again. If you're an author, you're going to ask who's the ideal reader profile for someone who would benefit from a book like blank by blank. If you're an entrepreneur, a business owner, you might ask who is the ideal client profile or buyer profile for someone who would benefit from a product or service or business like blank. It's going to give you really specific information. It's going to give you demographics. It's going to give you psychographics. It's going to give you platforms that they frequent. It's going to give you behavior. It's going to give you buying patterns. It's going to give you a lot of really detailed information. And I would recommend taking note of what social platforms are recommended in those ideal profiles, because that's going to come in handy later on. If you remember when I was talking about tone, the difference between brand voice and brand tone, tone is very subjective. It has to do with who you're speaking to. It's like the chameleon effect, right? The way that I talk to colleague A is going to be different from the way that I talk to friend B, which is different from the way I talk to family C. Just kind of bear that in mind and take notes, print it out, remember it, whatever you want to do. It's going to really come in handy. From there, you're going to ask chat GPT to identify keywords. And the way that I like to, and I've done all this work myself too, so I know the kind of results that are going to be popping out with questions like these. I would ask chat GPT what keywords or what phrases would your ideal person be Googling if they were wanting to learn more about or wanting to seek assistance with or wanting to hire out help for blank, whatever it is, whatever your niche is, whatever your genre is, whatever your product, your service, based on your competitor. These are successful competitors that we're looking at that have done something similar to you in a way that's better than you're currently doing. That's why we're doing this kind of back-end research and using them for data to leverage to use for your own brand. If you wanna take it a step further, you can utilize a, a website like SparkToro. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. You do need an account, I believe, but you get five free searches before you know they make you pay and charge and stuff. And if you type in a website, keywords, whatever, it'll give you like an even deeper breakdown of the platform forms that they hang out on or other similar search terms or the gender breakdown, location, geography, whatever. If you really like data, you could play around with that. And then finally, all of that information that we gathered, we're going to use that to inform our content or our content strategy. This looks like social platforms, identifying which ones make the most sense, right? Because if you have a target audience in mind, helps to know where they hang out, that's going to inform your delivery. That's going to inform your tone. That's going to inform the type of voice that your brand is developing, right? SEO, search engine optimization, that's always a plus. But most importantly, it's going to help inform your language, your audience language, right? Because this whole video is about tone, it's about voice. So language is going to be a really big part of that. 
So we talked about what a brand is. We talked about tone versus voice with a couple examples, statistics for why that's important. We talked about finding your voice through, identifying your values, considering your target audience, identifying keywords, using tools like SparkToro, leveraging that information. Finally, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a mood board. And this is kind of where it gets fun, for me at least. <laughs> You're gonna head over to Pinterest. If you don't have a Pinterest account, you might wanna consider creating one. It's free. If you don't use it after this video, it's fine. Just unsubscribe from all the emails or something. But either way, I would recommend going on Pinterest or maybe even Instagram. And I would start researching those values that you selected or qualities that are similar to those values and type aesthetic after it. I want you to just kind of see what naturally pops up on Pinterest, what kinds of vibes are popping up, what kinds of images or recurring patterns or themes are you seeing. The ones that speak to you, you're gonna start collecting those in a mood board that you're gonna create. And a mood board is basically what it sounds like. It's a collection of images that kind of start to develop their own sort of brand, their own vibe for lack of better word. That's gonna help influence or inform your identity or your mood, your tone, your voice, right? It's just a visual representation of the idea of your brand's voice. And you're gonna use that mood board to inform your brand colors, if you don't have that yet, to inform the font of your brand, if you don't have that already. So if you're really interested in learning more about those visual components, you should definitely check out that video. It's it's very tutorial, t tutorially. <laughs> I record my screen, I show you about hex numbers, eyedropper tools, how to do all those things, literally, showing you so check that out if you want more information on that but all of this information that we're gathering so far is going to inform your platform it's going to inform your tone and your voice once you have that mood board and you have that collection of photos themes i want you to take a minute step back look at it and think about all of the words that you would use to describe your mood board if you have a lot of purple and blues maybe a word is pensive or mysterious or depth or something, right? So maybe maybe if you have a lot of creative, natural, authentic pictures, maybe there's brush strokes, maybe there's bright colors, words to describe that might be bold, might be natural or eclectic. Those words are going to help inform your brand's personality, which is why it's called a mood board. And from that mood board, if you wanna take it a step further, you can create a brand board. And that's basically where you start collecting recurring patterns and colors from those pictures and you slap it into a document that looks like this that I have on the screen. I've got my fonts, I've got my colors based on some of my favorite images that I swiped from my mood board. So again, if you wanna learn more about that, go check out that other video on branding. With all of that being said, G. Lauren, that all sounds great. I wanna know how this fits into a real life situation. You're in luck because I've got two examples of very different brands that do something very, very similar. There's a YouTube channel that I watch and that I really like. I've been absorbing their content for the past couple years or so, I would say. It's called Soft White Underbelly. And the way, and they basically interview outcasts, people sort of on the margins of life, the people that everyone else is scared of, that no one wants to talk to, the people that you wouldn't wanna be caught in, in an alleyway with, right? They take a lot of these outcasts, these social outcasts, and they interview them. And they give them a plat, this guy, Mark, who produces this channel, gives them a platform to tell their story as authentically, as raw as they want, and he captures it all on video. Some of these interviews are 30, you know, 15, 30 minutes long. Other interviews are two hours long. It just really kind of varies. So as a consumer, I would describe his content as unfiltered, conversational, candid, very candid, and it's all produced through high quality visual materials. And his signature thing, his sort of unique selling point is that he leveraged his background in photography because he was a very successful photographer. I wanna say he shot photos for Apple. I thought I heard that somewhere. And what he does in every single one of his videos is he takes a full body portrait of the person that he's interviewing. And then throughout the video with the voiceover still, like the voice of the person being interviewed, it still carries over the photo as it pans down and it's black and white and you can see their entire body and just their humanness, right? So based on all of those qualities, on all of those attributes, on those values, the best way that Mark felt like he could communicate all of these qualities is through black and white photography. He leveraged a skill that he already had and zeroed in on the depth, on the candidness, on the, authentic, on, on the authenticity of his subjects through black and white portrait photography. And it's all, it's all very, very well done. Versus an account like Humans of New York, if you remember that account. They, I, I remember them being super popular like in the 2010s. 
So there is an Instagram account called Humans of New York, and he does very he does very similar stuff. He's a guy, he's a photographer, he goes all around New York City taking pictures of people, very, very similar. And although these pictures are also conversational and candid, I would argue that they are a little more eclectic. They're a little more lighthearted compared to soft white underbelly. I would say that he focuses in primarily on the average Joe. I don't feel like very often he highlights major social outcasts, right? Like the kind of people that is, that are often interviewed on soft white underbelly. So he does something very, very similarly, but in an entirely different way. And all of those qualities, the the eccentricity, the average Joe, it's candid, it's conversational. He captures this through color photography, people in action, doing what they're doing when he catches them and asks to interview them, right? That was like his unique selling point is just capturing these candid photos of people already in their element and grabbing a couple little quotes from them. So they both do something very, very similar, but very different in very different ways at the same time. They both do the same thing, but their tones are different. They both do the same thing, but their voices are a little bit different. Their vibe is a little bit different. The kind of experience that they're providing is a little bit different. So if you ever worry about, I don't know if I should pursue this thing, this book, this business idea, whatever, because I'm not the first person to have done it. There's nothing unique about me. Think about Cinderella and how many iterations and interpretations of Cinderella there are. Everyone has their favorite and they know why. It's the same thing here, whether you're soft white underbelly versus humans of New York, people like some of the interpretations that other people create for them, right? <sighs> so I know that was a lot of information. If you have questions, please leave them for me down below. I read all of my comments. I try to get to as many of them as I can. But before we sign off, I do have a couple call to actions that I want to bring to your attention. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I'm doing a webinar series. The next one uh, is today, so you won't be able to catch it. But um, I'll leave a description of all the other upcoming webinars that are happening. It's free. And the next one is called Mastering Content Creation. So that's super exciting. I am going to be giving a workshop in October at the Dallas Writers, Dallas Fort Worth, Texas Writers Conference, which is really exciting. That's from October 5th to 6th. I'm also going to be giving a workshop um, at CreativeCon in downtown Chicago in February of next year. If you're in Chicago, you should definitely consider coming. Please don't be scared off by the snow and blizzards. And then finally, I do have a Patreon that offers more behind the scenes experiential content. It's $1 a month. Shout out to my homeboy, David. He was the first to sign up for my Patreon. So thank you, David. Other than that, that's all I got. Be sure to like and subscribe by doing that. You're letting other people know that it is something worth value, worth investing their time into, and it helps other people find the channel that way. So I appreciate you. Take care until then, and I'll see you next time. Bye.